All right, guys, so we are just about at one o'clock now, so we're gonna get started. So first of all, good afternoon and happy Earth Day. Today marks the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, and we have events that have been happening all day to help us celebrate. And the one you're tuned into right now is our Baboon Experience. Um, and just a reminder that all of our programs today are brought to you by Diamond Packaging, who was founded in 1911. You can see their little logo and website up on the screen there. They are a global industry leader specializing in developing innovative and sustainable packaging solutions. And for many years, Diamond Packaging has been a presenting sponsor of Earth Day, donating saplings and pollinator seeds to guests that come to the zoo for Earth Day. So if you've been on grounds for an Earth Day in the past, I'm sure you've seen and talked to some of them. And we're very happy to have them continuing their support this year. Um, they did donate saplings and they're sponsoring the events of the day again today. So thank you very much, Diamond Packaging. We appreciate it. And while all the pre free saplings um, have all been claimed, there are still some sustainability baskets that our zoo shop has created that are available to order. And if you're interested in that, you can go ahead and jump on our website. Those orders will be open until 10 o'clock tonight. So we encourage you to get on there and check those out too. So let's get into our baboon experience now. So my name is Annie Wheeler. I'm the lead zoo naturalist for programs at the zoo. And we are joined by one of our really awesome zookeepers. Claire, you wanna introduce yourself over there? Hi guys, happy Earth Day. Um, I'm Claire. I am one of the baboon keepers at the zoo um, and I'm really happy to join you guys today and uh, talk to you about some enrichment in baboons. Great, great. We're very much looking forward to it from our side as well as you guys. Um, so during this experience, I just want to remind you that you won't have access to audio or video. So we can't see or hear what you are saying or doing, but you do um, have access to the chat function. So if you don't already see the chat, Go ahead and hover over the screen at the bottom. You should see a little chat icon you can click on and you can type messages to us. So if you have any questions throughout the experience, we really encourage you to utilize that chat and we'll try our best to get to them throughout the experience and hopefully a little bit of time at the end of it as well. So today we're gonna to be learning a little bit about enrichment and seeing some in action with our baboon troop. So the first thing we're gonna do is watch a couple of clips of some of our zookeepers that are placing food and enrichment around the baboon habitat at the zoo. So we can get those videos going. Um, and Claire, can you explain to everybody exactly what enrichment is and why it's so important to use enrichment with our baboons? Yes, um, so enrichment is something that all keepers will give to any animal at the zoo. Um, it helps to encourage natural behaviors and to keep them stimulated mentally and also physically. Um, so enrichment can be anything from what they're doing here, they're using paper mache, um, and stuffing some goodies and some food inside of it. Um, it can be different types of food that they don't usually get um, every day um, to a puzzle feeder that helps encourage um, problem solving to get food out of difficult areas. Um, so it's super important. We wanna always make sure our animals are active and moving and using those brains that they have. So um, to encourage a high quality of life in a zoo. That's great. And that's gonna be especially important with our baboons because they are so smart, right? Yes. They must be pretty good at those puzzles. They are. Some of them are better, others, some get a little frustrated and like to give up, but we have three that definitely like that is their thing. They love to do puzzle feeders and use those, those smart brains of theirs and big brains, so. Nice, nice. And what are some of the baboons' favorite enrichment items? You said that um, there are a few baboons that particularly like the puzzle feeders. Are there any other um, enrichment items that they have particularly enjoyed or are there any enrichment items that you've tried and they just don't care about or don't like? Um, so all of our baboons love food. So any, of course they like their daily food, they get their produce and everything, but they also like their enrichment food. So that's something that we wouldn't give them as part of their daily diet. So one of their absolute favorite foods is pasta. So all of our baboons will love pasta. We always know they're gonna love it. Um, so we typically use that a lot. Um, so we can either scatter that around the enclosure, um, like they're, they've scattered some food around here in the video. Um, that helps to encourage, so they're foragers in the wild. So we always wanna go back to encouraging those natural behaviors. So we'll scatter it throughout their enclosure so they have to go around and pick that food up. Um, like I said, that's usually gonna be a favorite with everybody. Some of the ones that I've seen they don't love is a scent enrichment. Um, so a common scent would be like a perfume. Um, other animals, like I know big cats really like scent enrichment. They like to roll around in it. Our guys really, I haven't seen that they like to engage too much with it. 
maybe they do, maybe they love the smell of perfume, but you know, you can't really tell they, but they don't, our guys won't rub it on themselves or anything like that. Um, we do use spices for scent enrichment. Some will like to, you know, try a little bit of it, but it's, they don't consume a lot of it. And I don't really see a huge reaction from them, from scent enrichment. Okay, that's interesting. We have a couple people asking about the pasta. Is it raw pasta you use? Is it cooked? Is it both? Does it depend on the day? Um, it kind of depends on the day. They can have, usually it's going to be raw um, because it's, you know, we can't go down and boil some water and cook some pasta. Um, they love raw pasta, but we also, for our, I don't know if anyone saw our baboon egg hunt that we did um, last week, um, we actually, um, the curator, uh, Lindsay Brenda boiled and dyed some spaghetti um, to make edible grass for baskets. So it was green. Um, so that was cooked. And then we also added some dye to kind of be like, oh, why does it look that way? And kind of make them think about what food that is. Um, that's another way to engage them with their food or different enrichment being like, oh, that looks different. Um, but then of course it's edible and they can eat it. So we can use both. That's great. It sounds like you guys are always busy trying to come up with new ways of enriching. We the animals are. Of yeah. And it, it can be not difficult. It's fun because when you have primates, obviously they're very intelligent. So they figure things out pretty quickly. So you may have built something or done something you're like, oh yeah, this is really going to stump them. And then they figure it out immediately. So it's constantly, you're constantly thinking about what you can do next for them and what will provide them good entertainment and things like that. So it's fun. Nice. That's very cool. Look at the keepers just put out a whole lot of enrichment in their habitat over the last couple minutes there. So let's switch to a video um, of the baboons actually coming out and exploring and prowling around to find some of that. And we can see how they react. So Claire, how many baboons do we have at the zoo? Because I see a whole bunch of them coming out here. Yep, we have 11. Um, so we have six females and five males. Um, so the one right in the center here with the globe, that's a male. His name is Pico. He is nine. Um, so our ages range from, so he's one of the youngest that we go nine to 26. Um, so our 26 year old, she's a female. Her name's Pimento. Um, I don't know where she is right now, but um, so yeah, nine to 26 and 11. Nice, nice. And I just wanna let everybody know that these globes that are in their habitat are paper mache and they were made by our zoo campers and our zoo homeschool groups. So it was really fun to have um, our kids at the zoo get involved in making some of that enrichment. So Claire, I see this big guy coming up front. Can you tell me a little bit about him and his personality? Yep, so that's Mancino. So as you can see, he looks much bigger than the other male that was right there. So he is our dominant male. Um, so he has that really big mane and he looks much bigger. That's because he is older and bigger than them. Um, so he, well, our dominant female kind of rules the whole group. Um, he's kind of the muscle in that. Um, and most of the baboons are gonna respect him. And kind of like what Pico did, he kind of moved away when Mancino came closer to him and grabbed what he wanted, kind of got out of there before uh, Mancino had the opportunity to grab what Pico had. Um, so he'll kind of get what he wants um, he can kind of just push other baboons um, away from something and they're usually going to respect that and move away from him. So Nice. And he, now I know that we do have um, a lot of strong personalities in the troop. Can you tell me about maybe like your favorite baboon or some of the, the personalities that stick out a little bit more than the other ones? Yeah. Um, so the one that I keep referring Pico because he was right in the middle. Um, he is... I don't like to pick favorites. I do like all of them for different reasons. Um, Pico is really silly. He's really, he's a goofy guy. Um, he's younger, so he's a little more, you know, hyper. I feel like all of them are kind of hyper just as a species in general. Um, but he has a very strong personality. Um, and if you come and watch, he'll be one that you'll probably uh, focus on just because he kind of bounces around a lot and engages a lot with different enrichment. Um, we have one of our lower ranking females, Pearl. She's 21. She is, so she, since she's lower ranking, she is less likely to come up to the fence or really engage with enrichment a lot with the other baboons just because she is low ranking. Um, but she's a very sweet girl. She's very quiet, you know, minds her own business, doesn't get into trouble. She's, she's cute. She's, whenever you guys can come visit again, she is 
um, the baboon with the shortest tail. So that's pearl. Yeah. Very nice. And then what are some ways that you use to tell them apart when they're all in a group like this? Like, you know their personalities, but what would be a good way for a guest maybe to identify some of them? So let's see. So Mancino, obviously he's going to be the biggest. So he's probably one of the easiest. Um, Pearl, like I said, she has the shortest tail. Um, Pico, he has um, really light eyes, so light skin around his eyes that make it, he, that's, none of the other ones have that, so that's a characteristic that you can use. Um, one of our males, Jefferson, has an underbite, so that's another one that guests can use, the underbite, that's Jefferson Jr. Um, and then Kalamata, who's slinking away right now up top, he has very long limbs. So he's very lanky and very tall, very graceful looking. Um, so those are a few that you can use. Yeah. Nice, nice. And I don't know if you guys have caught on um, by the names that Claire is using, but our troop of baboons, they are olive baboons. And because of that, most of them have olive related names. Um, so that's, that's, you know, each one has its own individual name and a personality to go with it as well. Um, now, I do see that some of them are climbing, but they are spending a lot of time on the ground. Are they mostly terrestrial, Claire, or are they typically more climbers? They are. Um, so they're going to spend most of their time on the ground in the wild, um, walking long distances and foraging on the ground for their food. They can climb, and you will see them climb and everything, but for the most part in the wild, they will stay on the ground. That's pretty great. And I can tell just by them using their hands, they have really great dexterity that helps them forage around, too. Um, they do typically eat fruit and vegetation and seeds, a lot of things you'd find on the ground, uh, but they are technically omnivores. So yeah. you will find them getting bugs um, and even small birds and small mammals when they're available. Um, and I believe that may have happened a couple of times at the zoo when some wildlife ventures into the baboon habitat. So although they look like they're nice and calm now, getting with that enrichment, uh, they definitely are not something you'd want to encounter out in their natural range. They're not really going to be friendly with humans at all. So Claire, do you guys ever go in with them or what's your interaction like with the baboons? Um, so we are never in there with them. Um, we never have full contact with them. All the contact that we have is going to be through our mesh. Um, in our mesh inside, the mesh outside is a little bigger, but our mesh inside where they sleep, um, they it's smaller squares so they can't reach their hands out as well. Um, so that's all for our safety and theirs. Um, like you were saying, they can kill small animals. Um, when you guys visit them, you will be able to see that their canines are very large. Um, it's very intimidating. They have it for that purpose. Um, and so when you really see them interact and sometimes they'll get into little fights, it's pretty clear that you don't want anything to do with them in that uh, full physical contact there. Um, so these guys would not make great uh, friends to hang out with <laughs> inside their enclosures, um, neither as pets, anything like that. And when you see them, you can really understand why um, you wouldn't want that interaction. Absolutely, especially with the big ones like Mancino. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't want to be anything I'd get too close to for sure. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> now, I do want to talk a little bit about the baboon conservation story because it's a little bit unique. Mm -hmm. um, if you guys tuned in to the lion experience at 11, we talked about how lion population is declining along with the other natural predators. So in honor of 50 years of Earth Day, we're looking at the last 50 years of baboon populations, which have actually increased. And although this sounds like it's good on the surface, the root of why it's happening is absolutely a problem. So in many areas of Africa, natural habitat is being destroyed. That means that baboon predators like lions or leopards cannot survive in those areas because they don't have that habitat to live in. And this throws off the balance of the ecosystem. And it's kind of similar to what's happening here in Rochester with our white-tailed deer population. So if you live in Rochester or pretty much anywhere else in New York, um, I'm sure you're aware we don't have a shortage of white-tailed deer. They are plentiful here. They're all over the place. Um, and that's mostly because of the loss of natural deer predators. So we do still have somewhat of a coyote population here, but we have lost wolves altogether as predators in New York. And that has created an overpopulation of those deer. And that's also led to overgrazing and causes the ecosystem to degrade. So similarly in Africa, baboons are now able to expand beyond their natural territory. 
as their predators are no longer able to survive in those areas. So to, so to keep the ecosystem in balance there, the predator populations really need to be maintained. That means the best thing for baboons is actually to conserve their predators and the habitat that their predators need. This will allow the baboons to thrive in the areas they naturally belong, and it will also avoid potential conflict with humans because there is a possibility as they continue to spread that they'll start um, interacting with humans and really being a nuisance to them because like Claire said, you don't want baboons getting close to you. They're not something safe um, for humans to be around. So if they do end up spreading more into human settlement areas, they're going to have a huge conflict with humans there. So the best thing we can do is just protect that natural habitat that all levels of the ecosystem need in Africa. And at the zoo, we are working on that, even just from Rochester. So we partner with conservation organizations all over Africa, and actually all over the world, that work to conserve not only those animals, but also the natural habitats that they rely on for survival. So that means that by you guys supporting our zoo and participating in things like our baboon enrichment experience and everything else that we put on, um, you're also supporting the conservation of animals and habitats all over the world. So it's really great. Um, and we do want to make sure that we see baboons thriving in Africa in nature, uh, but we also want to make sure that they're staying at a reasonable level that would be naturally maintained there. So they're, they're quite the interesting story when we talk about conservation with them. Yeah, they are. It's a little different than other animals. Yeah. That's great. So we do have time to take a few questions. Um, we had a couple of people asking Claire what foods exactly were put out for this enrichment, like what kinds of fruits or veggies are around or additional enrichment may have been put out during this experience? So I know for sure that they had some Kool-Aid out. So this was, I believe, just a Kool-Aid powder. We didn't mix it with water this time. Um, so Linda and Mike, our two keepers that you saw there, um, spread out some Kool-Aid. So that's a little treat. That's not something that they would get every day, but that is an enrichment food. Um, so they love that. I think we all love Kool-Aid and all love Kool-Aid powder. I think everyone's probably eaten some plain Kool-Aid powder before, <laughs> but so we spread that out. They love that. Um, I'm sure there was probably some dried beans. We have popcorn kernels. Um, they also spread out their diet there that they eat um, every day. Um, they also, I don't know if you guys saw, they have, I think this guy Pico in the front has one. It's a little chow biscuit. Um, that's called primate chow. It's something that they get twice a day. Um, so that's something that makes sure that gets all the vi right vitamins and protein and everything like that. Um, that, you know, it's just adding on to their, their daily diet as well. Um, I think they probably put out a bunch of other little goodies. Um, yeah, pasta, popcorn kernels, dried beans. They love dried chickpeas. That's one of their favorites. Um, so I'm sure Linda and Mike put a bunch of good stuff out there. Nice, nice. I have somebody asking um, when they typically get their food out in nature. So are they usually going out at nighttime foraging for it? Are they active during the day? It's a little bit of both. Um, so they're going to be active during the day. So they sleep at night like we do. So in the morning they'll wake up and then they'll go um, and walk a long distance and forage and eat throughout the day there. They might have a little, little afternoon nap and hang out and socialize and then they'll make their way back. Um, to where they, they sleep. Um, so at any point in time there, they'll be eating throughout the entire day for the most part. Great. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, now, I've seen that a lot of people have seen them at the zoo and heard them making some noise and getting a little bit rowdy. So we have somebody asking if you ever have to break them up if they start getting a little too crazy with each other. Um, so we can't. We can't do that. Um, but that is part of a baboon troop. Um, so in the wild, at our zoo, at any other zoo, um, especially with troop primates like baboons, um, you will see those little scuffles, the screaming. They're very loud. Um, so a lot of it can seem a little more dramatic than it actually is. Um, a lot of it is just screaming. They can hurt each other and they have before. Um, but when they get into that, we kind of just let it play out. Um, they figure it out. Um, they know their social dynamic, they know their place in that. Um, so usually it will, it'll only last maybe a minute or two at the most. Um, it's kind of explosive and then it, you know, uh, decreases. So, yeah. I agree. And then how large can their troops get? Or what's the average size and what's the biggest that they can get? 
So they can get to over 100. Um, so in the wild, the average is probably 50 to 100. I think even 150 they can get to. Um, but within that big troop, you're going to have little other um, subgroups that will exist. Um, so ours is 11. Seems big, but in comparison to the wild, it's a it's small one. Um, yeah. Okay, great, great. Um, we have people asking if they jump a lot or if it's mostly just walking and climbing. They jump a lot. They love to jump. They're, um, they're usually like bouncing off of walls or different like fire hose or rope. So they use it. Um, sometimes they'll jump over each other if someone's taken too long to walk. Um, so yeah, they're very active. Um, they run really fast. Yeah, they're, they're very springy animals. Nice. nice. Yeah. I'm sure it, it makes them a little more so when they have lots of enrichment around too. So oh, really great to sure. watch them exercise that adaptation yes. too. Yeah, they get very excited and they need to get to it first. They need to see what it is. So they'll definitely use that for jumping. Yeah. We have um, a question about their age. So you said that we have a pretty wide range of ages in our troop. Um, what's our oldest baboon and how old do you typically expect them to live? So our oldest, she's 26. She turned 26 in October. Um, so she is older, but she could easily live into her 30s. Um, so she does have, you know, some things that come with age. She does have some arthritis. Um, she is on, you know, some medications for that to make sure she's comfortable and everything. Um, but for now, she's doing very well. She's very healthy. She takes her medication great. She, you know, she interacts well with the other animals and those would be things that we're looking at, you know, how is she dealing with old age and right now she seems fine. Um, so she could easily live into her 30s. So That's great. Yeah. Great to hear. Um, mm -hmm. We have people asking about the lengths of their tails. So noticing that some of them have longer tails and some of them have shorter tails. Mm -hmm. um, what is the use for their tail and why do they possibly have different lengths depending on the individual? Um, so these guys, so sometimes you'll see um, primates that have, they can use their tails to climb. That's called a prehensile tail. These guys do not. So you won't see them climbing with that tail. Um, they do have shorter tails. Some of them do. Some, that's just the way they're born. Some have little accidents throughout their life um, that someone was maybe a little mean. Um, but that's kind of where the, the variation of length comes from. Um, but as you can see, sometimes these beautiful long tails, um, but they don't use them to climb or anything like that. Got it. Got mm -hmm. it. Um, we have somebody asking if we track or make sure that all the baboons have an opportunity to eat without being pushed away by the more dominant ones. Yeah. So that's a good question. Um, so in order, because we do have those dominant ones um, that they can easily get pushed out, we chop up our diets into little cubes. So we make sure they get five pounds of vegetables and two and a half pounds of fruit every day. So we make sure that all those pieces are pretty small so we can scatter it throughout the enclosure. So then nobody's going and grabbing, you know, a carrot and a whole apple and then running back in and leaving nothing for the other ones. Um, so we make sure that they're getting all of that. If we see one that's getting a little more pushed out, we might have to, you know, um, update our management with that and how we're going to deal with that. But right now we don't see anything. We also track their weights every month. Um, that's how we could also see if one of our less dominant ones was being pushed out. But right now they're all in a ideal weight range. So that's great. Eating well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, our next question is if you need to access their exhibit area, how do you encourage the baboons to enter their off exhibit area? So how, how do you shift them? And do they typically respond pretty well to shifting? Um, for the most part, I mean, number one is food. They love food. Like I said, they're very food motivated. So they do know that when they come in, maybe I'll open up another room and I'll have food in there. So they're like, yeah, I want to go inside and get that food. Um, most of them are really good about it. Some of them are a little worse than others. Um, like primates are very smart. They like to play games. Um, most of the time it's not because they don't know what to do or how to do it. They just know that in that moment, maybe they don't have to, maybe they can sit in this doorway and you know, you, as you watch the uh, clock tick by. But um, that usually will more happen in the summer. In the winter, they're like, nah, I wanna go back inside. But we have a couple that like to play some games to not shift right away. 
But for the most part, we don't have too many issues with that. That's, that's very good. Yeah. Um, we have somebody else asking if they're all family. Are they all related or not all of them? They're not all, most of them are related in some way. Um, so we do have a lot of our three youngest, um, Olivella, Samson, and Pico. Those are all Mancino, our big guys, um, offspring. They have three different mothers, but they are all related to Mancino. Um, other than that, they their previous facility, some of them did, did come with their babies. Um, and then other ones are related to some baboons we had in the past who have now passed away. Um, but in most ways, I believe, other than Mancino, they're all related in some way. Um, or their you know, relatives are directly there. Cool, very yeah. cool. Um, and how often do they all see the vet? Do they have individual exams or is it just as things come up with them? For the most part, it'll be as things come up, but our doctor, uh, our vet does come in whenever we have an issue. Um, he's always there. They will have an annual checkup. We make sure they all have their vaccines. Um, and, but yeah, if say, you know, one got bit, he'd come check out, um, see if they needed any like, you know, painkiller or anything like that. Um, but yeah, so he's always there. Um, they will have an annual checkup um, just to make sure, you know, they're, they're getting that checkup. Um, yeah. That's great. Great. And uh, we have one last question here because we're just about out of time. Uh, people are asking how they're doing with the zoo being closed and guests not being there. If it's making a difference in their actions or how they're interacting with each other or if it's not much of a difference to them. I don't see much of a difference. Um, they're pretty much acting the same. They're really excited that they can go out a bit more now. Um, so that's really nice for them. It's really fun to see them being able to just kind of hang out and lay in the sun and everything. But other than that, they seem to be dealing well with it. Um, nothing bad, you know, so that's always good. Um, pretty much normal, yeah. That's good. Good to hear. And we are very much looking forward to the time when we can reopen and have our guests come back and visit the baboons. Um, especially the staff is going to, I'm sure, be happy to start seeing people again a little bit more often. Yeah, yeah, that'll be nice once you guys can all come back. So that is about all the time that we have for this experience today. Um, but I'd like to invite all of you guys that are watching right now to check out our next experience at 2 o'clock, which will be an opportunity to become a local conservationist in our area. You learn about how we monitor our ecosystem here in Rochester. It's very cool. It's with our other lead naturalist, Dave Will. It's going to be very interesting, so please feel free to tune in then. So, Claire, thank you so much for coming on and talking to us all about the awesome. baboons. And fun. thank you guys so much for tuning in. Enjoy the rest of your Earth Day, and we'll see you guys later. Bye. Bye.